Hi everyone, I'm Marissa Della Paz. I'm one of the LSU residents. Um, I just moved here about a year ago. I just, I'm about to finish my first year of residency at the um, LSU Family Medicine Program across the street. Um, so if you need a primary care doctor. Um, there are some pictures in this PowerPoint that may make you a little queasy. I tried to keep it, you know, G. Um, and then also there are some products on, in here that have name brands on them, but I have no disclosures. Um, so anyway, let's get started. Um, my presentation is Here Comes the Sun and it's protecting your skin from skin cancer and how to reduce your risk of developing skin cancer. So we'll go over sunshine and rays and what radiation means um, and then we'll go through skin cancer and then sunscreen and prevention. So sunlight, what is UV radiation? It's basically nanometers, it's 290 to 400 nanometers, and there's different types of UV radiation. Um, one type is called UVB, which is, you know, you could say B for bad, which is the most active. This is the radiation that causes sunburns in your skin to darken, and this is the one that puts you at risk for skin cancer. And then there's UVA, which is the majority of skin uh, UV radiation. And this is the one that causes wrinkles and the dark spots that we sometimes see on our face. And so there are different medications that put you at an increased risk for um, what we call photosensitivity, which is where it makes your skin more sensitive to the sunlight. So amiodarone, which is used for heart conditions, antibiotics that we have for bacterial infections, um, diuretics, so some people may have furosemide or Lasix. Um, there's also hydrochlorothiazide. Those can be um, used for medical conditions like fluid around the heart or your blood pressure. Anti-inflammatories can put you at risk. And then sulfonylureas, which are type 2 diabetes medications, um, so glipizide and gliburide. Um, so there's also medical conditions that can put you at increased risk for skin cancer. So certain connective tissue disorders, vitiligo, which is what, you know, the supermodel has. You can see, oh, sorry, um, she has the pale pigmentation and then dark spots. Um, and then alcohol can also put you at risk for developing skin cancers. And alcohol is more of a behavioral, so people who drink alcohol tend to kind of... Um, not think as clearly and so they won't think to put on sunscreen or they may stay out in the water too long and um, that can put you at risk. So let's delve into skin cancer. Um, skin cancer is the most common form of cancer in America, the, the United States. Um, the majority of it is caused by overexposure to sunlight and most skin cancers can be prevented, which is huge. Um, the, there's three main types of skin cancer. There's basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. And melanoma is the one that most people are afraid of, and rightfully so. It's the most dangerous one, and it causes the most deaths. So risk factors for developing skin cancer. Um, you may have heard me say on the news, anyone with skin can, get, or anyone can get skin cancer because we all have skin. Um, and so having skin, you're at risk for skin cancer. Um, people who have lighter natural skin color, they're at increased risk um, because they don't have a certain pigment in their skin that's um, a little bit protective. People who burn easy, have freckles or redden um, easy with sun exposure. People who have blue or green eyes are at increased risk. And then people with blonde or red hair. Um, other risk factors, if you have a family history of skin cancer or if you have a personal history of skin cancer, um, if you're out in the sun more than others, you're at increased risk. Um, HPV, um, a lot of people may have heard of like the HPV vaccine. Um, it's a sexually acquired um, virus and that can put you at risk for skin cancer. So the first type of skin cancer I wanna go over is called basal cell carcinoma. Um, and it's the most common form of skin cancer and it's locally invasive, aggressive, and can be destructive. Um, it typically doesn't spread to other parts of the body, um, and it's mainly on, it's found on the nose, ears, scalp, and forearms, um, and sometimes it's on private areas as well. And so I'll just show a picture of this one. This is a classic um, picture of a basal cell carcinoma, and so you can see this is, it's round, has uh, roll, rolled borders, so you can see like the little, kind of like a 
protrusion in the skin. You see little blood vessels right here, and those are called telangiectasias. Um, it kind of has a pearly appearance to it. You see the shininess of it. Some of them have ulcerations in the center, and then some have like a little, um, what we call umbilicus, which is like a little dimple in, on the top of it, okay? And then classically, it's found on the nose or on the face. And so what are risk factors for basal cell? UV radiation, which is sunlight, and that's the most important one. Um, if you have a history of basal cell carcinoma, you're at increased risk. Um, if you're Caucasian, men typically get it more than women. Um, it increases with age. People from Louisiana are at increased risk. And then people who have, um, have been using tanning beds are at increased risk as well. Um, I don't want to get into too medical specific. We'll keep it kind of general. There are three types, and there's nodular, superficial, and morpheiform. Um, but you don't have to memorize the types. That's for your doctor to know. Um, so here's a few pictures. Um, you see the ulcerations, and you see the rolled borders um, and the little blood vessels. And so these are just nodular, and this, you know, this one's kind of more progressed with the ulcer, and it's on the nose. Um, there's another type called superficial, and this is kind of like the second um, predominant type of basal cell. It's in men more than women. It's usually found on the trunk, which is the torso, like your belly and your back. Um, you see it has like a scaly appearance. It's really not that hard. It's kind of softer. It's a light red to pink. Um, the center is pink, and the periphery, you can see there's little dark spots around the area. You see? So that's kind of classic for this type of basal cell. Um, when you shine a light on them, they, they illuminate. Um, so kind of like that pearly appearance. Um, and then they usually grow pretty slow, but they can be any size um, at presentation. So here's just another picture of superficial. So you see the scaliness and the shininess, and then you know not really defined borders, but um, very prominent. And then you see it on this gentleman's uh, torso. Just more examples of different sizes. This one's actually gotten pretty big. Um, so you know they grow, but it's slow grow. So you know that this one's been there for a while. And this one's um, just another one, but it's very, very subtle. Some people miss them, and, you know, if you see a spot that you are concerned about, don't hesitate to ask your doctor and be like, hey, like, this is new. Can you take a look at it? And so um, your doctor is more concerned with if this, this is low risk or high risk, but some features that are low risk of recurrence. So, like, if, if you have it removed, will it come back? And this is typically low. Um, so if it's on the cheek or the forehead or your scalp or in the pre-tibia, which is your shins, um, the trunk, arms, or legs, that's usually low risk. Um, and then it just depends on what type of basal cell it is and if there's nerve involvement because some basal cells can grow into the nerves and you can have like numbness and tingling like that. So if it's your first one, it's usually low risk. Um, if it has really easy, like if you can draw a border around it, it's low risk. And so some high risk, if it's in the center of your face, your nose, your lips, eyelids, eyebrows, um, your eyes, your chin, ears, um, like the front and the back side of your ears, that's high risk for coming returning. Um, your hands and feet, and then your neck head and pretibia. And this also depends on size, which is why it's important for you to see a doctor. And then these are just uh, um, the treatment for high risk. So if you have a high risk for recurrence, um, there's something called Mohs surgery, which a lady in, um, was talking to me about how she had to have Mohs surgery on, um, was it your toe? Um, and so um, this is basically done by a dermatologist who's trained to do surgeries. Um, for like sensitive areas such as the face where you don't want to have a lot of scarring. It's usually done outpatient. You go in, they do it, and you leave. Um, it's done under local anesthesia, so they'll just use a little bit of lidocaine on your face or wherever they're doing that surgery. And that basically reduces the normal tissue removal, so they're not taking like a big chunk. They're just going to take as much as, like as little as possible until they remove it. 
And so here's just a picture. So you have that lesion, and then they just re remove a small amount. If they still find cancer in the stains, they'll do another small amount, and then another small amount, and another small amount. And so um, diagnosis and treatment, usually you can diagnose basal cells by clinical exam. Um, you can also have a skin biopsy. You can do a biopsy and something called electrodesiccation and curatage, which is where they take a little blade and they kind of buzz it to um, remove it. Um, they can also just treat it without biopsying it. If it has those classic um, features, they'll just treat it. Um, and then dermoscopy which is like a, basically a magnifying glass that helps the physician see the features that are kind of hard to see at the, with the naked eye. And then there's different biopsy techniques, so shave, punch, and excision. And so this is a, derm, uh, oops, sorry, this is a dermoscopy, and so you can see how it'll highlight that skin lesion that's suspicious for cancer. And then this is a shave biopsy, and basically it's a little blade, and they'll put local, and they'll just kind of go back and forth and they'll wiggle it off until they remove the lesion. And it has a really small, like a very shallow scar and it usually heals pretty quickly. And then a punch is basically they take a little pencil tool and they'll kind of, they'll twist and get, and it'll just pop out. And they can send that for biopsy, or for pathology, excuse me. And then for some cancers, they want to do like a, a elliptical excision and this is just to show you, but you guys don't have to know that. I'm just letting you know what they do. <laughs> um, so actinic keratosis, this is, a lot of people have this. Um, this is benign, however, you do want to get it examined because it can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. So actinic keratosis, these are rough, scaly, red, um, little spots on the skin, and it's usually on sun damaged skin. So your forearms, your hands, um, gentlemen or females who have kind of like a thinner hair um, patch on the back of their head, they may have it there. Um, if it has tenderness or bleeding, you want to get that checked out because um, it may ha have progressed. Okay, and so this is just a picture, and you can see like the scaliness and the red, and it's pretty flat, but if you rub your fingers across it, you feel that rough texture. And so here's some more, and you see it's on the back of this gentleman's hands. You see the scaliness and the red. I apologize if the pictures aren't that great. And then here's one on the nose, so some da sun damaged um, skin. And so you see, once again, the scaliness and redness. Um, this kind of highlights it a little bit more. And so squamous cell carcinoma, this is the second most common type of skin cancer, and they can be uh, pretty ugly, but they're smooth, thickened skin, um, some can be ulcerated. They can occur anywhere on the body, the head, neck, the mouth, um, around the nails. Um, typically in people who have light skin, it's, they occur more on like sun exposed areas, but people with darker skin, um, it can usually be on the legs or places that have chronic scarring or inflammation. And so risk factors, sunlight, um, ionizing radiation. If you have a poor immune system, so if you have HIV or you're on like chronic steroid use, um, you're at risk. If you have chronic inflammation, so scars or burns or ulcers that aren't healing, you're at risk. Um, and then arsenic exposure, a family history, um, HPV, and then some genetic factors. So common locations, like I was saying earlier, the head, neck, um, the back of your hands and your forearms, um, your legs, arms, your shoulder, your back, um, chest, abdomen, and this one can spread to lymph nodes, your lungs, your liver, brain, and other areas of skin, and sometimes your bone. So definitely something to take seriously. And so we see this a lot. We'll have a patient come into the clinic and they'll say, I had this like little growth on my, my face. Like, what is this? This is a form of skin cancer. It's, cut it's a type of squamous cell. It's called cutaneous. Um, and you see a little horn, which, you know, fortunately it's very noticeable and patients don't really like the appearance of that and they'll bring it to their doctor's appoint uh, attention. So they, it's a blessing that it's, you know, not very appealing to the eye. Um, this is an actual a metastasis of squamous cell, and so this is a spot on the skin that 
was a spread from a primary lesion. And so it can look like that. Here's one that's um, in growth. And so you see the scaliness, the redness. You can see the borders are pretty um, easy to trace. Okay, and it kind of has that rough texture as well. And then margillin's ulcer. So this is actually um, a precursor to squamous cell. And you, or it can be a type of squame, excuse me. And so this comes from chronic wounds or scars that aren't healing. So if you have something that's not healing, um, you should bring that to your doctor's attention because it can be um, cancer. And so diagnosis for squamous cell is by skin biopsy. Okay, and the big one, melanoma. So melanoma is the most common, or the most serious um, skin cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer. Um, there's four major types. So we don't have to go through in depth. Um, once again, this just kind of helps the physician determine how serious it is in um, the treatment. And so risk factors for melanoma, fair skin, if you have red or blonde hair, light eyes, light, co light eye color. Um, if you have multiple moles or you have moles that look similar to melanoma, or if you have intense freckling, you're at increased risk. Okay, so the one type is superficial spreading, and you can see the, it's kind of more raised, round, the, the borders um, are irregular. If you were to cut it in half, it's not really symmetrical, just kind of an overall ugly mole. So you're like, oh, probably should get that checked out. Um, here's another one, and so, and we'll go through the ABCD um, of melanoma later. But if you were to cut this in half, it doesn't look symmetrical. Once again, like the borders are irregular. Um, the color, there's difference in color. So some areas are a little darker than others. You have a black up here, and then this is like lighter brown. Um, and then the size itself, like if it's bigger than the size of a pea, um, you probably should have it checked out. Okay, and so here's just another example with the different colors within the spot. Um, it has a raised little bubble in there. Here's another one. Okay. So you have the dark color here and light color here. Um, just very ununiform. Then here's another one. Just kind of irregular in different colors, different textures. Um, here's a nodular melanoma. Um, and this one is actually, it's hard to see on the screen, and I apologize, but it actually is a bump on the skin. So it looks like someone kind of cut like a cherry in half and pasted it on the skin. Um, and these are a form of melanoma. They can also spread to other forms, parts of the body. You can, I saw a patient who had them um, all over his skin. He had it on his belly, his chest, um, near his heart. So... Let's see, and then this is another one. Um, this one is about 10 to 15%. It's most commonly found in sun damaged areas of the skin. So you see it on this gentleman's jaw. It's usually seen in older individuals and it can begin as a tan or brown spot, um, but it'll gradually increase in size over years. Okay, and so just some more examples. Okay, and so ac this one, acral lentiginous melanoma, which is a mouthful to say, this is most common in uh, dark-skinned individuals. Um, it most commonly occurs on the palms and soles and under the nail. Um, I actually, my dad, a lot of people actually think that they stepped on something and it's like a little bruise. Like, you know how you can smash your finger in the door and you can have like a little, like a blood blister under your nail? Um, my dad actually had a spot on his foot that I was like, what happened there? Because he props his feet up in his lazy boy chair. And I was like, what is that? And he was like, oh, I, I don't know. It's been there. I was like, no, go get that checked out because you don't want to, you just, it's a, melanoma is a serious thing. And you just, if you have any questions, it's better to get taken care of. And thank God it was not melanoma, but um, better safe than sorry. And so here's another one. You, you see it and you're like, ah. Maybe I stepped on something, not really sure what this is. Um, go get it checked out. 
And so here's another one. This looks like a little ulcer right here. And then you have this dark area, kind of irregular borders. Um, this is just a form of melanoma. They all look different, but um, I guess kind of my take home message is if it doesn't look right, it probably isn't. And it's not a, it won't hurt you to get a second, second look. Okay, and so here's another one, um, a dark spot on the bottom of this gentleman's foot, um, irregular borders, um, different colors, and it's probably increased in size if we, if we knew this gentleman. Okay, and so here's another one, um, and this is um, under the nail, as you can tell, and so this comes from the nail matrix, and it grows out, and you can see that it's very easily demarcated from the rest of the nail. Um, sometimes you can have it next to the skin of the nail and it's called Hutchinson sign. Um, a lot of people, I don't know, if, maybe not, Bob Marley actually had this, um, I believe it was on his great toe, um, and he actually passed away from um, acral melanoma. So, but see how easy it is? You think you smashed your finger and you're like, oh, it's okay. But if it goes from the, like, from the nail matrix all the way to the end of the nail, um, you should, that should be a concerning sign for you. Okay, and so here's just another picture. It starts here and then goes down the whole length of the nail. Okay, and so a misnomer is that, you know, melanoma, it has to be black or brown, and that's definitely not the case. Um, a, there's something called amelanonic melanoma, which is a pink, um, kind of a pink or a tan color. And this is about two to 10% of cases. And it can present as a flat spot, a raised spot. Um, it can look like a little nodule, um, or it can just be a subtle light brown um, discoloration of your skin. And so this one, you can see that it has very well-defined borders and that, um, that kind of changes it, okay. So here's another example. Like for me, I, you know, this kind of looks like maybe people would mistake it for ringworm or like eczema, but this is actually a form of melanoma. Okay, and so how to diagnose melanoma. And so a lot of people can, um, well not a lot, it's usually diagnosed by visual inspection. And so your doctor can take a look at it. Um, and there's like the ugly duckling sign. So if you are someone who has a lot of spots on your skin, um, they usually kind of have the same pattern, like they all kind of look very similar. And then you have that one ugly spot that doesn't look the same. And so it's called the ugly duckling sign. Um, you can also see like the ABCs, um, which is what I was talking about earlier. And so asymmetry, and so I apologize if the picture is small. Um, so asymmetry, if you were to cut this lesion in half, does one side look like the other? And you can definitely see no. Um, the border is pretty irregular, so you can't, it's not like a nice pretty border. In the spot, there's different colors, so you see areas that are darker and areas that are lighter. Um, the size of it is greater than six millimeters or the size of a pea. A lot of people are easy to, everyone knows what a pea looks like. And then evolution, and so does it change in size? Does it change in color? Um, has anything changed about that spot? And if you have a question about a spot, some patients will take pictures of their spot, and then, like say three months later, they'll take a picture, and then three months later, they'll take a picture, just to be able to give themselves that peace of mind that it's not changing. Um, and so there's a different, there's multiple ways that you can diagnose melanoma, but like I said, changes in size, or if it's a new spot, um, changes in shape or color, and then if it's greater, this one says seven millimeters, but typically this, it's six millimeters. Um, if there's any inflammation or if it's cresting or bleeding, um, if you have any sensory change, so like numbness or tingling, or if it's painful, um, and they say like any of the major features or three of the minor features are concerning. And so you can diagnose the, the melanoma that's under the nail, which is what subungal means. Um, and so it's usually an older age, African Americans, Asians, or Native Americans, and it's that brown to black band, like I said. 
Um, and it's usually on the great toe, like your big toe or your thumb. And then um, your risk factors for that is if you have a family or a personal history of it. And so the pictures when I was talking about the biopsies, the one where you did the little elliptical shape, um, that is one that usually is used to diagnose melanoma. And sometimes they'll have to take a little bit more skin to like the fat to make sure that they get it all. Um, if pathology comes back and they didn't remove all of it, you may have to have surgery. Um, but if they don't remove it all, it can be appropriate because areas such as the face or the palm or the sole of your foot, your ear, um, those are more sensitive areas that may require most surgery. And so they'll just do a small biopsy and with plans to go back later. Okay, and so for screening, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, um, they don't recommend yearly screening or annual screening, which is where your doctor does a full head-to-toe looking for skin cancer. Um, there's not really any evidence to say you should do it or you shouldn't do it. However, if you do have a history of skin cancer, they, you should get regular checkups or you should at least be paying attention to what, what spots you have. Okay? And make sure you tell your doctor of any unusual moles or changes in your skin. Okay. And so my favorite part, how to reduce your risk of developing skin cancer. So you want to um, avoid sun exposure from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., which is the peak hours. Um, people think that, oh, it's cloudy outside. I can work out in the yard a little bit longer. No, ma'am. Cloudy and ha um, hazy days are just as bad. Um, a lot of people actually get sunburned on those cloudy and hazy days because it's not as hot. They think that, you know, it's shade and there's a breeze usually. Um, and the next day they have a pretty bad sunburn. Um, off the sun can actually reflect off water and cement and sand and snow. And so if you Google um, sunburn, snow, you'll actually see people um, who take off their, their goggles from snowboarding and they have a face burn. And that's because the sun can reflect off the snow and then you also have direct sun rays on you. Okay, and so to protect yourself even more is you can actually have some protective clothing. Um, so long, like lightweight, long sleeve t-shirts like this um, lady here in the picture. She has um, a lightweight top and then she has pants. And then you can see that she's wearing a hat that covers her face. Um, and so sunscreens, um, I know a lot of people have questions about that and I'll try and do my best um, to explain questions if you have questions after this. But there's two different types. There's a chemical sunscreen and there's a barrier sunscreen. And so chemical absorbs the UV radiation and eliminates it as heat. Um, so you may perceive it as like you're still getting kind of hot. Whereas a barrier sunscreen, which is like zinc oxide and titanium oxide, actually um, reflects and scatters UV light. So a lady and I were talking before, and she said that she can feel the difference when she's wearing zinc, which um, that's maybe the reason why, um, is because it's reflecting the UV light off. And so SPF, that measures the sunscreen's ability to protect against a sunburn, and it's UVB alone. And so it's the ratio of minimal dose of solar radiation that produces um, redness, basically. And so the minimum SPF that they recommend is 15. And so I, on the American Academy of Dermatology website, they actually recommend people wear SPF 15 for everyday use. And if you're going out in the sun, they recommend a minimum of SPF 30. Um, if you have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have lighter skin, they recommend 30 to 50. Um, and then you want a sunscreen that has broad spectrum coverage, and you want to make sure that you apply it 15 to 30 minutes before sun exposure. So if you're getting the kids or you're about to go on the boat, while you're loading up the car, put on the sunscreen. That way, by the time you actually get out in the sun, it's, it's already soaked in. Um, and then you want to reapply it every two hours. And so I have no preference as to what sunscreen you get. Um, you can actually go on to eczemafoundation.org. Um, they have a really good list of skincare products or sunscreens for like sensitive skin or people who have eczema. 
The um, American Academy of Dermatology website actually has a list of products you can see um, they recommend. But Blue Lizard, um, one of the ladies I work with, she uses this on her kids. And you can just, and this is really just to highlight the label. So you have broad spectrum coverage, which means it covers UVA and UVB radiation. And then it's SPF 30. And then I believe, there it is, it's titanium dioxide and zinc oxide, which is a barrier um, sunscreen. And then this one's for sensitive, and I like it because the bottle turns blue in UV light. So it's kind of like a reminder. Okay. And so the, the teaspoon rule, and we'll go over this, but a good way to know if you're putting on enough sunscreen is a teaspoon roll, and it's a teaspoon on your face and your neck. We'll go over. I have a slide. I'll show you. Um, and then there's water resistant. So if you're going to go out in the water or if you're going to play sports and you're going to sweat, um, you want to see if the bottle, if your sunscreen has water resistance. And so it's usually 40 to 80 minutes. And then you want to, for me, it kind of makes sense, no sprays or powders. And this is more for the kiddos um, because they can accidentally inhale when you're spraying them. Um, and then there's an uneven distribution um, tip, and you can kind of tell when you're spraying that like you miss spots. Um, so if you do prefer um, sprays or powders, what you can do is spray it on your hand and then rub it on your face and your arms, um, or you can spray on your body and rub it in, just so that you have a more uniform distribution. And so the teaspoon. A teaspoon basically looks like a penny, and that's just to give you a visual, visualization of what a teaspoon is of sunscreen in the palm of your hand. Okay? And so the teaspoon roll, you want one teaspoon of sunscreen on your face and one teaspoon on your neck, and then two teaspoons of sunscreen on the front of your body, and then two teaspoons on the back, and then one teaspoon on each arm, okay? And then two teaspoons on each leg. Okay, and so further sun protection that you can do, um, when possible, be in the shade. You can wear the tightly woven clothing, um, dark colors, clothes that cover your arms and legs. Um, clothing actually comes with um, a UPF, like a protection factor, and you can look for it um, on the manufacturer tag. And you can use these clothes while swimming. Um, and then the wide-brimmed hat that covers your head, your ears, and your neck. And so here's a pretty hat. So you can be protecting yourself from the sun and looking cute. Um, and then other things to use are sunglasses that have the UV protection, um, sunscreen. You want to avoid indoor tanning. Some people like to go to tanning beds before they go to the beach because they think that it will prevent them from getting a sunburn. But if you tan, your skin's being injured. If you burn, your skin's being injured. Um, so really, you want to avoid changing the color of your skin. Um, and then you want to be careful with water, snow, and sand. Okay. Once again, I have no affiliation with Banana Boat. Um, this is just to show you aloe vera. Um, and so if you do have a sunburn, um, how do you manage that? And so cool compresses or taking a cold bath. Um, moisturizers after a bath. Um, you can take hydrocortisone cream found over the counter to help reduce um, the inflammation. Um, if it's so clear with your physician, but if um, to reduce inflammation and pain, you can take ibuprofen. Um, any sunscreen that blisters, you want to have that um, evaluated by a doctor. Okay, so children, so if you're taking your child or your grand, uh, grandbaby, to the beach or to the pool. Um, typically, they recommend no direct sunlight, especially for those who are under six months of age. Um, when possible, put them in the shade. Um, have them wear a protective hat and clothing. So, you know, baseball caps are cute, but they don't protect the back of the baby's neck. Um, and then the short sleeve t-shirts, if you're gonna put that on your baby or your kiddo, make sure that they have sunscreen on their ears, their neck, and their arms. Um, so when sun exposure is when you can't avoid it, um, they recommend minimum amount of SPF 15. And then for the face and the back of the hands, you want something that's non-irritating to their skin and eyes. Um, Oil-based emulsions 
um, of titanium dioxide and zinc are preferred. And then you want the broad spectrum coverage to cover both types of UV radiation. And so um, the Skin Cancer Foundation, they actually, on their website, they have a seal of recommendation, which is um, products such as like skin sunscreen, skin moisturizers, cosmetics. They actually have window films and glass, awnings, umbrellas, clothing, and hats that have the seal of approval um, to reduce your risk for skin cancer. And so summary, everyone is at risk for skin cancer. Um, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma are the most common forms of skin cancer. Um, sun exposure increases your risk for all skin cancers. Um, to reduce your risk of skin cancer, you really want to have those sun protective behaviors. Um, and then you want to pay attention to your skin, okay? Um, be aware of the suspicious mole, or if you think something's ugly, have it checked out. Um, and then you want to see your doctor regularly, okay? And then I got all my information from a medical website called Up to Date, um, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the Skin Cancer Foundation, the American Academy of Dermatologists, and the American Academy of Pediatrics website.